Hello, this is Professor Keen. Welcome back to my lectures on electricity, magnetism, and light. We have been looking at the work of Thomas Young, his lecture on the nature of light and colors. This is contained in chapters 20 and 21 in A Student's Guide to the Great Physics Texts, Volume 3. Let me recap one of the main points that we made in the previous lecture, and that is that Young's two-slit experiment provided striking evidence for the wave theory of light. Not only that, but Young was able to measure the wavelength of light, and he quoted that the wavelength of red light is one thirty-six thousandths of an inch. If you convert this into nanometers, that corresponds to 705 nanometers, which is extremely close to the, to the acknowledged or nowadays measured wavelength of red light. He also measured the wavelength of violet light to be one sixty thousandths of an inch, which corresponds to 423 nanometers if you do the conversion, which is strikingly close to the wavelength of violet light according to contemporary measurements. So here we have a situation where back in 1809, Thomas Young was able to measure the size of something that was less than one hundredth of the width of a human hair. That's quite an astounding measurement and quite a success. And this was only understandable if one adopts a wave theory of light, which is what Huygens is pushing for here. Another piece of evidence that Huygens, I'm sorry, that Young provides is the color of thin plates. So let's move into chapter 21 on films, bubbles, and rainbows. And there he states at the bottom of page 249 that a still more common and convenient method of exhibiting the effects of the mutual interference of light which is a characteristic of wave nature of light, is afforded us by the colors of thin plates of transparent substances. So you might have noticed, if you look at something like a soap bubble, which is a thin film of soapy water, if you look carefully at a soap bubble, you sometimes will notice that when it's illuminated, there are swirling colors that appear in the soap bubble. You might also have noticed that if you have a bit of oil spilled on top of water and you look at it when illuminated from above, those swirling colors once again appear in the oil layer. This is the kind of thing that Young is talking about when he's talking about the colors of thin plates or thin films as it's usually called nowadays. And what he's going to say is those colors can be completely understood if you take light to have a wave nature rather than a particle nature. And he says specifically that the colors of thin plates are caused by successive partial reflections that are produced by the upper and lower surfaces of the plate, or by two twice reflected light when passing through or transmitted through a thin plate. That second example I gave, he says, is much less striking. So what I'd like to do is focus on the first example where you have successive reflections from the upper and lower surface of a plate. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in some detail in the next uh, few minutes. But let's jump to the next page, page 250. If you look at this long paragraph on page 250, this is where he explains a couple of these examples that I've just mentioned, the colors of soap films and the colors of thin plates. And the first example that he gives is what he calls the scale of an oxid formed by heating. So you might have noticed sometimes if there is a piece of metal and if you clean this metal or polish it very, very well and then you heat it, Sometimes you'll see these colors kind of creeping over the surface of the, of the metal. That is a layer of oxide that's forming on top of it that serves as a thin plate. That is understandable, once again, if you consider the reflections off of it using the wave nature of light. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about this. So if you have a metal, I'm going to make it brown right here. Oh, let me make it straighter. Actually, let's make it a deep blue. So this is a metal surface like iron. And let's suppose you polish it and then heat it. And as a result, you get this thin layer of this oxide forming on top of it. So this is this oxide layer. And don't be misled. I'm not making this blue to make it sound like this is a blue oxide layer. This just indicates that there's an oxide layer. And let's suppose it has some thickness, which we will call T. And then, of course, up here you have air. Now, 
What is what happens if you illuminate this from above? So let's start easily or simply by imagining you use red light and you illuminate it from above. So you illuminate the oxide layer with monochromatic or red light. So monochromatic means one color. And let's spe specify that this is red light. And furthermore, let's say then that you view this from above. So you're kind of looking down at this as you are illuminating it with this red light. Now, what happens to this red light? Well, some of it is going to pass through this interface through the oxide like this, some of it is actually going to reflect off of it. So I'm going to just sort of draw a U-turn here to indicate that it's reflecting off of it. And then some of it, like I said, is gonna go through and that light that goes through is going to reflect off of this surface, the iron, and I'll again make a U-turn like this to indicate that it's reflecting. So you essentially have two portions of light, portion one and portion two. And the point is that beams one and two are going to be interfering with one another. They obey the superposition principle insofar as they are waves. And remember, if beams one and two are exactly in phase with one another, then they will be constructively interfering. If they're exactly out of phase with one another, they will be destructively interfering. And if they're somewhere in between, they will be neither constructively or destructively interfering, they'll be somewhere between, okay? So what is the condition for constructive interference? So what is the condition for constructive interference between beams one and two? Well, let's just say what we mean by constructive interference. That would mean that they're in phase with one another. And so if you view this from above, the film, the oxide film will appear bright. And so what is the condition for that? Well, you can probably see that beam two travels an extra distance compared to beam one. How much extra distance does it travel? Well, that would be twice the thickness of the film because it has to go down, bounce off the iron and come back up. So the extra distance would be two T. And the condition for constructive interference would be if that extra distance is just enough to accommodate either one wavelength or two wavelengths or three wavelengths so that when it comes out and it meets beam one, they will be exactly in phase with one another. So either one lambda or two lambda or three lambda or so on. And more generally, if two T is equal to some integral number of wavelengths, so M would be equal to zero, one, two, et cetera, then you would have constructive interference. So you might imagine, let's just take, for example, if this is red light, the wavelength is about 700 nanometers, uh, in, in air, what we would need to do is we would need to compute for this oxide the wavelength of the light that's in the oxide. So remember, oxide will probably have a different refractive index than air. And let's suppose, I don't know exactly what the refractive index of oxide is, let's suppose it is such that the wavelength in the oxide is 600 nanometers, slightly shorter than in air, so 600 nanometers in oxide. Well, if then the thickness of this film is half of that, let's say 300 nanometers, then the wave that reflects off the iron will have traveled 300 nanometers on the way down and 300 nanometers on the way up. It will have traveled 600 nanometers, and as a result, it will have oscillated through one entire wavelength so that when it comes out, it will be exactly in phase with beam number one. That means as you view it from above, one and two will be interfering constructively and it will appear red from above. If, on the other hand, the if that extra distance 2t is equal to m plus 1 half lambda, where again m is 0, 1, 2, and so on, that is, so i.e. it est, um, the extra distance is a half of a wavelength or one and a half wavelengths or two and a half wavelengths. Well, in that case, then rays one and two will be destructively interfering with one another, and it will appear dark when viewed from above. So the iron will appear black because of this oxide layer. And that's precisely what Young is talking about here. Okay, so that would be the case of destructive interference as opposed to constructive interference. Okay, now here's an interesting point. What if the oxide layer um, 
was um, illuminated instead of with red light, it was illuminated with blue light or yellow light or green light. Or suppose it was illuminated with all of those at once, like white light. Well, if it was illuminated with white light instead, then um, if, the, if the oxide layer was a certain thickness so that red light constructively interfered upon the double reflection, uh, then it would appear red. But if it was a, this thickness so that blue light experienced constructive interference, the oxide layer would appear blue, and likewise with green or orange or yellow. And if, for example, the oxide layer had differing thicknesses over different regions of the iron, then certain colors would appear would be constructively interfering in certain regions and not in others. In other words, this oxide layer would produce variations in color of the iron. That's exactly what Young is talking about here. He's saying if you take a sheet of iron and you polish it and then you heat it, the thickness of the oxide layer is going to depend on the temperature to which you heat it. And as a result, the, um, the iron could appear different colors when viewed from above, depending on the temperature with which you heat it. Um, and so that's the, I'll show some images here of iron heated to different temperatures. So there are different thicknesses of oxide layer on top of them. And also as a neat uh, side note, I show here a picture of a sword that has been differentially heated. So different regions of it were heated to different temperatures. And as a result, the steel appears to be different colors because of different thicknesses of oxide layer at different locations. That is one of the first experiments that, that Young is talking about here. And once again, why is this evidence for the wave theory of light? Well, because only because waves can constructively or dis destructively interfere with one another to produce these colors. The next thing that he talks about is a film of soapy water that is stretched over the surface of a wine glass. And what I'm going to do is take a break and come back to that example next time to explain the colors of soap films.